Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Remove Film from Trey. As always, I am your host, X Mortis, and with me here is Count to introduce our guest. Hello, everyone. We have a very special guest today. Um, I'll tell you a little, about, a little bit about him. He's known for leading the billionaire show band, directing the American Astronaut, Stingray Sam, Crazy and Thief, and spreading the word on how cockroaches might save the future of humanity. He has a new movie out that you can watch right now for free called Deep Astronomy and the Romantic Sciences. He's the last of the clowns. So thank you for joining us, Mr. Corey McAbee. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, I've been following you for probably about 15 years because that's about when you did Stingray Sam, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the internet was a buzz about that. And then everyone was like, oh, you haven't seen the American Astronaut? Like, I know I hadn't. I, I watched, I loved it. We would have big parties in college where like 20 of us would just watch. A- anyone who was new to the group, we'd have to show them the American Astronaut. So I probably watched it like 10 times throughout college. And I know, I know people have um, based um, like their romantic relationships on that film. Like they would, <laughs> they would meet someone and go, yeah, I really like this person, but they didn't like the movie and I, I don't think I don't think I can do this you know I, so, I every romantic partner I make them watch it <laughs> it ah. is a little bit of a litmus test happy valentine's day everyone. happy valentine's yeah. day yeah it's, it should be become a valentine's day classic um, actually I, I don't know if they still do it I think they might have stopped it in COVID but in Stingray Sam there's one um, there's a uh, a scene where uh, Stingray and and the the carpenter's daughter are walking around Mars. It's like the last episode, and there's these giant egg shaped buildings uh, with glass walkways going between them. That's actually a sewage treatment plant, and they have tours on Valentine's Day. Oh, cool! <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was watching the end of that uh, last night, and I was remembering like this is like. Very pretty. Yeah, yeah, Uh, it was was pretty. That's uh, Scott Miller, the the DP, did such a such a fantastic job with that film. Um, It was that was when um, when that film was made. Stingray Sam was made when um, uh, it it, things were very new uh, in mobile technology, and I was commissioned by the Sundance Film Festival, who was commissioned by the GSM Association, which was the biggest. Um, global mobile company in the world. Um, I, I don't know if they're still, I don't know what their status is now, but at the time they were like it. And so they commissioned Sundance to commission five films to be the first films ever distributed on mobile devices. And they got wow really famous filmmakers and me to, to make them. And, uh, the uh, yeah, like Justin Lin, him, him and I actually became friends through that. He made the Fast and Furious films and all those, and uh, everybody w- everybody had careers but me. I was sort of the odd duck of the bunch. And um, so afterwards, um, I was considered a pioneer in new technologies, and everybody else had real jobs. So whenever they wanted somebody to talk about um, mobile films, they would they would call me in. And so I would I would be on these panels with people who actually were working in new technologies and doing all sorts of amazing things. And so I learned about what was going on. And I thought, um, you know, I'd like I'd like to make a film which is a feature film, but can be broken down into ten minute episodes so that they could be downloaded uh, onto phones. And this was before people had internet on their phone. You actually had to buy films from the operator. Uh, for your right. films. yeah so so i made stingray sam and that was uh one of the things about the aesthetic was trying to create something that would look good on a small screen and so um well first it was episodic uh so it could be broken it's a serial down. it's a serial right and uh it's also got um like there was very limited 
like the the camera movements were very uh limited uh there was the the sets everything was very simple and a lot of the choices that we made for stingray sam are pretty much standards now you know for film um but anyway that was an experiment you pioneered it just that's yeah, where yeah, for, for this uh new digital era that we're in yeah it you see it when you when you watch through it um and I do like that it's a serial too, because it's like a throwback. But then in this whole new world that we're in <laughs> at the same time, it's like very cool to me. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, I was trying to do when, when when the American astronaut came out. Everyone said, "Oh, it's a musical space western," and I was like, "Is it?" And uh, so I thought, you know, I should make a musical space western. Uh, <laughs> so, so you didn't have any any concept of uh, American astronaut being a musical sp- like what was it in your mind? Well, I knew it was a musical, but um, but and and of course it took place in space. But the aesthetic was actually taken from my family. Uh, you know, they were all into you know country stuff, and uh, my dad was a mechanic, and so was my grandfather. And um, they uh, the the way they look, the way you know Samuel Curtis looks in his coveralls, and uh, like even his um his uh, capsule looks like my dad and my grandfather's shops you know so what is that i always thought it's a train (laughs) well it's train too yeah (laughs) of course his his ship the way it flies it's like it's a cross between a train and like one of those giant dumpsters that people rent and put out front of their houses when they're (laughs) throwing everything away so that's why it doesn't have any wheels either it just has the bottom you know like like that and just crashes into things yeah but uh, anyway, so yeah, I made Stingray Sam. It was my first intentional musical space western, and I took a lot of the themes from the American Astronaut and flipped them. You know, like th- they have similar concepts, but taken in the opposite direction. So you know, I was playing with that. Yeah, it, it's um, hard to describe anything you ever make to people, um, and then even Stingray Sam and the American Astronaut are so different from each other, and they're both. Space Western musicals, <laughs> yeah. which is one, it's one cool. You yeah. make some, was uh, Reno something commissioned as well by Sundance, or did you make that to submit to Sundance? Yeah, that was Reno. Reno was uh, there. There was actually two versions of Reno. One was the one with the uh, oh, that was commissioned by Sundance, and that's with okay. the uh, in the bodega. And then there was another one that uh, someone I was working with said, you know, let's make another version of Reno. Uh, so I made one with kaleidoscopes and, uh, it was pretty fun. I I like both of them, but I I like the first one best. I think they're both good. Uh, Yeah. That was the first film ever distributed on mobile devices. Reno. That's a lot. I I didn't know that until you 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 said that. Um, I haven't seen the kaleidoscope version. I'm relatively new to, to your work. (laughs) I first, uh, I first saw American Astronaut on Count's birthday last year. He was showing some movies that he dearly loves. And uh, <laughs> so so this year he said well, it would be a good birthday present if we could talk to Corey Maccabee. So here we, Yay. <laughs> here we have you a month later. Well, that was easy. Yeah, I tried to... I figured I'd reach out. You were talking about in your in your Discord that you were looking sort of for people to talk about deep astronomy. Oh yeah. So yeah. I, yeah. Thank I, you. I figured I do a podcast about film. I'm in your discord. <laughs> Why shouldn't I message Why not? you and find out? Well, every, everything I do is kind of an experiment. And, um, when I, when I made a deep astronomy, what, what happened was I wanted to make a film without any money. And because I, of course never have any money but make it with um uh just letting everybody participate who wanted to and because for a while i was working with people who were very closed you know they were very guarded and so if somebody said you know i'm an illustrator you know we would would just never see the email you know and so uh when i when when I was going in a different direction, I, I just decided if anybody contacts me and says, you know, come stay at my house, I'll, I'll go stay at their house. If any, you know, if they're a, an illustrator, I want to be able to say, sure, you could be a part of this project. So 
I came up with Captain Ahab's Motorcycle Club, which was the global collaborative. And the first step was to make Captain Ahab's Motorcycle Club. And so I asked for chapter patches. And I got about 60, 60 different artists are around the world making chapter patches for their local cities and countries. Oh, wow. Uh, with the theme being Captain Ahab's Motorcycle Club. So there's a lot of Moby Dick and motorcycles. And um, it was great. And then I thought, well, I should get out there in the world and, you know, get the name Captain Ahab's Motorcycle Club on marquees and have social events where we, we can talk to people and be in the same room. Uh, so I wrote a bunch of songs uh, pretty quickly. Worked with my friend Matt Cowan. We did these um, very simple tracks very quickly. And I would go out and I would sing to these recordings. and. I told everyone, you know, just download the recordings. You can download each individual track. You can make your own mixes. You can use any of the pre-existing tracks. As long as my scratch vocal fits your track, I should be able to download it and perform it that night on stage. And so I went out on tour. And at first I was just doing, you know, performing to the, to the original tracks. But then I went to Australia and they're like, no, you can't sing to recordings. We have to give you a band. So, oh, cool. so yeah, I had this big band and we're, 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 you know, we toured or played a couple of different shows. And uh, then I came back and I went on tour for two months with that one guy uh, who was the bass player in The American Astronaut. And he, I opened for him with Captain Ahab's Motorcycle Club and started getting slammed with recordings. It was great. And so I'd be on stage. I go, this one comes from Oslo, Norway, from this person. And I'd start it. And if I messed it up i'd be like okay let's start that over again and so i was and and the sound was different from what everybody was sending me you know and it was so much fun and i learned a lot too like there was one song uh where the music went run, da, da, dun, da, da, dun, da, da, dun. and everybody who made the a song um you know who made a track it was pretty much would copy that feel and this one guy sent me a track that it was the same song but it had like fog horns in it and it went blue, 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 blue. And I was like, oh my God, I can't. Yeah. Wow. How am I going to sing to this? And so I got up on stage and just went for it, you know? And the, that one guy goes, uh, he goes, that was intense. Are you going to do that again tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, I think so. He goes, okay, every time you perform to that recording, I want to let me know because I want to watch, you know? <laughs> and then, um, and so then this, a couple in Stuttgart, Germany contacted me and said, can we use that track for an animated film for Captain Ahab's Motorcycle Club? And I'm like, yeah. And so they made this beautiful piece of animation and the music fit perfectly. And so one thing I learned from that was if I was in the room when he was recording that, I'd be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it must go like this. And I would have been wrong. You know, is, so, is that animation in the film or did you use something by that couple? No, the Captain Ahab's. Well, actually, yeah. Um, in deep astronomy, the, one of the two from the couple uh, did a animated piece. When you see the uh, the they, they were working as a team when they made that, but I think they went their own ways. And so um, oh, Henning Letterer, I think his name was, did um, the animation for the um, emotional mathematics advertising. Okay. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, I love seeing that on on the screen too. It's on a big screen. It's it's really amazing. But um, so going around doing Captain Ahab inspired you later on to do the same sort of uh, traveling around for deep astronomy. Is that what happened? Well, what happened was I, I, I originally I had to just pick a topic for a film and say this is what we're going to do, you know, and so. I decided the film I wanted to make was about Abraham Lincoln's embalmer uh, because <laughs> it, it, to me that, that story is yeah. just ripe with possibilities. Cause when you think about the embalmer, like chemical embalming in America was like four years old. Right. And I so it was very, yeah, it started, it pretty much got its, I mean, the, you know, I mean the Egyptians were embalming, you know, mummies right, way back right. when. But chemical embalming began, it was really horrible and hazardous. Uh, that form of chemical embalming began in France 
And so then somebody came up with a different version slightly here in America at the very beginning of the Civil War. And so the first casualty of the Civil War was uh, a good buddy of Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln said, we're going to have him lay in state in, you know, the in the Congress, or White House, I forget. But anyway, so they put him on, they put him out there. And Mary Lincoln, uh, Mary Todd saw him embalmed and said, he looks like he's having a restful sleep. <laughs> and somebody from the press saw that and wrote it down. And I was like, oh, cool, you know. And so then what happened was young men by the thousands went out and got killed. And the families wanted the bodies back, but the trains wouldn't ship rotting corpses. And so mm. these these guys would just leave their jobs. Some of them were doctors, some were furniture makers. You know, e everybody from everywhere decided this is where the money is. And so they become embalming surgeons, and they would go into a camp uh, of soldiers before the um, before the uh, a, a battle was going to happen the next day. And everybody knew when the battles were going to happen, and you know. And so they'd set up tents all around the battlefield and they would, uh, embalming tents. And then they would go into the camps and they'd say, if you get killed tomorrow, which you probably will, I will find you and I will ship you home. And so they'd give them little numbers, you know, they'd take their money while they were still alive and give them little, you know, like numbers painted on um, patches and pin them to their uniforms and then go in and, uh, you know, get killed. and then the embalming surgeons would wait among the dead and the wounded trying to find their commissions and then bring them back and embalm them in the tent and ship them home. And so that became huge. And so, so four years later, Abraham Lincoln gets killed. Actually two years later, uh, his son died and got embalmed. They buried him. Lincoln dies two years later. They dig up his son and they put them both on a train and they take him for a two and a half week journey through, uh, different states having oh. these giant uh i mean his son was always on the train but they would bring lincoln out and put him some you know have a big huge parade and then um open up the casket and people would parade by and by the time he got to new york they took took him from jersey the entire train on ferries uh they had this huge parade brought him to City Hall in New York, where the only photograph of him actually lying in state is, uh, that's in City Hall in New York, 500,000 people lined up to see him in two days, and they saw him. They paraded past him. Um, not everyone was nice. There were pickpockets, and somebody lit a fire that they shouldn't have, and you know things happen as, as crowds gather. Right. But, um, but the thing was, it, this was, you know, like, probably five, six days in, he got bad reviews from the press. Um, the, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he stunk. And so, so, so here's you know, every, all the biggest, most famous people in the world coming to to this thing. And there's you know, it's I mean, it's huge. It's like Led Zeppelin on tour, but everybody's crying, and there's <laughs> cannons and and uh, you know, like bands <laughs> playing, and it's just this massive, massive thing. And then they open up the casket, and if it's bad, it's your fault. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I thought that was a really interesting story. And, uh, and it was also going to be on the 150th anniversary of his uh, death. So there, there was a bunch of people going to be doing funeral reenactments. And I thought, oh, that's good for guerrilla filmmaking. You know, we could go get these, you know, people in costumes, you know, a bunch of people. Did you get any that. footage of that? No, we did not. Uh -huh. um, and, and the year before, too, I, I led a, uh, a tour uh, of the uh, funeral route in Manhattan and had a group of people. And we, you know, I brought photographs so we could stop and look at the locations. The buildings are all still identical to the way they were, many of them. And uh, showed, you know, pictures. And we had this wonderful time. And then we stopped and uh, ate at a noodle place and drank beer and just had a great, great afternoon. But um, the uh, but nobody nobody I, I had two people do things for Abraham Lincoln. Uh, both of them were illustrators. So 
while this was becoming apparent that there, there is a I, segment, sorry, about Abraham Lincoln in the film, right? Or was that the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I talk about, I talk okay. about Lincoln. It, yeah. Yes. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I say, uh, what, what, what is it? Um, Oh, that historians agree that if Abraham Lincoln had not been assassinated in 1865, he would have died by now anyway. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very good. <laughs> um, but, and it's a beautiful, um, it's a really nice illustration of how to bury Abraham Lincoln behind me when I'm talking about that. And that was done by Max Gruder, who is an amazing sculptor. I've never met him. But he's contributed so much graphics to both Captain Ahab's Motorcycle Club and the uh, the film. He, he's he's amazing. If you ever Gruter, uh, spelled with umlauts, Max Gruter, he does okay. fantastic sculptures all over um, Switzerland. Um, but uh, anyway, so uh, so it became apparent that I made the wrong choice uh, for stories, even though I still love that story and all of was the it going to be you think like a, a stage performance or you were going to try and make that into a full musical well i was going to have the narrator be on stage um the narrator was going to be one of the um one of the uh, characters from the play that abraham lincoln was watching when he got assassinated uh called That'd lord, be incredible. Dund <laughs> lord dundrary uh, look up pictures of him. He's, he's, he's amazing. Also, like, there's so many little high-end things. Like, um, when he, when um, John Wilkes Booth shot Lincoln and then jumped off onto the stage and broke his leg and yelled something that people debate about and then ran off, hobbled off, the person who directed and produced that play was the leading actress in the play. Uh, she was um. a British actress. She had dated john wilkes booth's brother like they had toured the world together uh performing so when he jumped off that balcony she knew who he was that's wild i i never knew that yeah oh here's here's something fun um you can see a photograph of this along my um the lincoln funeral route there's photographs and there's one picture where you can see a six-year-old Teddy Roosevelt watching the funeral procession <laughs> go by from his grandfather's funeral uh, window. And then oh. um, when he became president, he wore a ring that had Abraham Lincoln's hair embedded in it uh, when he was inaugurated. And now they're up on Mount Rushmore together. Story has a happy ending. <laughs> now, a lot of this do you pick Babe. up from books, from the documentaries that you're interested in? Where do you... Uh, I just this is like I, some really good tidbits of history here. It's it's just goose chases, you know. Like I I, I read a couple of books, which I, I don't usually say that, but I did. I read a couple of books, and um, you know, like chasing down information on the internet and things like that. There's there's one book uh, a, that's pretty thorough called Funeral Train. It's a big book uh, that tells you a lot of the information about the entire um, route. Okay, so you you had ideas for that, and then you, you felt it wasn't panning out, and then it wasn't. <laughs> I, I remember years ago rumors bubbling about a werewolf movie. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that I've th was I, that before that, or after this. That was a long, long time ago. Um, okay. Th um, th but this one, the what happened was, oh, in that movie too. Uh, I think. I have outgrown that film and the world has outgrown that film. Uh, <laughs> right. So I'm not going to do it, but I wanted to for many years, but the, um, so the Lincoln thing, it, it became apparent. This isn't going to happen. This is a bit off more than I could chew. Then while this was becoming apparent, I, um, went to, uh, I was, I was asked to perform in Wrocław, Poland, and they were going to pay me really well. And I needed to do it. And so I didn't want to do Captain Ahab's Motorcycle Club music because I would be performing to other people's recordings and then getting paid for it. And, they, and right. there was no way I could pay everybody, you know, and uh, I'm just not that good with doing my homework, you know. So I thought, all right, well, I got to do something new. So within two months, I wrote and recorded the Small Star Seminar, uh, my first solo album. Okay. and. I started performing to the small star seminar uh, with 
lyrics projected behind me first in Poland, just so people could understand me, but I liked it. And so I would do it in other countries. I performed in Russia and throughout the, you know, English speaking, uh, yeah. countries and Germany and Switzerland. I had German translations. So, um, so those things would be projected behind me. Once I started doing that, people from Captain Ahab's motorcycle club started doing artwork based on the music. And one of the songs that l- people were really paying attention to was the song called the small star corporation about a company that uh, helps you find the stars in your own mind. And so I started getting a lot of artwork for that. And I thought, okay, well, this is organic. So I started uh, doing science lectures before the last song. And um, sometimes I would write them down. Sometimes I would just improvise them on stage and wing it and see, you know, see what worked. And uh, then eventually I was, I was asked to perform in San Francisco at the Exploratorium, which is one of my favorite museums. It's a science museum, uh, inter- all interactive. And so I did a, uh, a hour-long version of, uh, of my first per, uh, science PowerPoint presentation called Deep Astronomy and the Romantic Sciences. And then um, later on, I, do- I doubled the length of it and then premiered that at Sundance at, uh, in 2018. And so I started doing science lectures. Um, and people would come out and they would film it. The same with my concerts. People would come out and film it. And after the shows, they would give me the footage. And, and that's what I collected for the film. Right. Was a uh, cultured cell culture part of that same thing? And it just didn't make it into the film and got released on. No, its own? Cultured, cultured cell culture is new. Um, that was something. And, and I only did it for about a year. Um, I, in deep astronomy and the romantic sciences, there's a company called the Red Planet Planning Commission, and so I thought, you know, I'm going to make that into a real thing. So now I'm I I I have the Red Planet Planning Commission, where I, it's the umbrella under which everything is. And so, th- at the very beginning of COVID, I started doing this thing with the Red Planet Planning Commission, where I would create narratives about how to terraform Mars by sending human compost and cockroaches as a first step. Right. And cuz I mean, you know, it's it's easier to send human compost than actual living humans. It's cheaper. <laughs> and so uh and and when the cockroaches get there, they're going to die, but you're going to start re you're going to start introducing a life cycle, life and death both at the same time. And so this was a narrative. This was a fictitious narrative, but in reality, I was working with organic burial grounds, green cemeteries, um, and getting them to reintroduce native milkweed um, in, that's you know, native to their areas um, to help the monarch butterfly migration go back and forth from Canada to Mexico. And you charted all that, too, uh, when I'm seeing I, your routes. You, well, yeah, I, I did. Um, and and it, it started off, it was just me on the phone talking to people. Um, in fact, the last place I went that, that I visited was um, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, they were the first people to work with me, uh, their sustainability department. And now they've got uh, in butterfly way stations and insect um, gardens all over their campus. Um, there was also other cemeteries that started reintroducing native milkweed and you know bringing butterflies to funerals and helping them. And one of the reasons I thought about doing this was I... Here we go back in circles. When I started studying uh, the history of embalming, it turned out I had friends who worked in green burial. Hmm. And so I started learning about that. And I also learned um, separately, I became interested in monarch butterflies when uh, uh, this German film crew uh, was coming out to make a documentary on butterflies. And they were going to follow the monarch butterfly migration from Chicago down to Michoacan, Mexico. And they wanted a singing cowboy for their uh, documentary. So they and they saw Stingray Sam. So they contacted me. Cool. Um, Is there any way to to watch that that film? It's called um, Butterfly Stories. I don't. I don't know. I don't know how how okay. anybody can find it now. It was it was commissioned by German Television, um, but it also played in a couple of festivals. Um, 
so anyway, so so I put the two together. I thought, all right, well, I, I know a lot about this green burial stuff. And also learning about it actually was very helpful to me when my mother was passing away, uh, even though she was uh, cremated. Just having that kind of information and that kind of perspective was um, helpful. Right. And so, uh, so oh, again, COVID happened. So I just started getting on the phone and contacting people. And so then, uh, then I thought, well, you know what? I want to go visit some of these cemeteries and I don't know how to drive and I've never had a bike, uh, or I've had a bike, but I never rode one, uh, years ago. But, um, so I got a bike and, uh, taught myself how to, how to ride, got, um, people helped help me buy uh, all the panniers and things and so i rode uh in autumn of 2022 i rode from maine uh portland maine down into florida on my bike and camped out and just had the most amazing time and i made stickers uh of martians you know great planning Planning commission stickers and gave them to every man woman and child i met all along the route you know every gas station every uh, you know, restaurants, every diner, every, everywhere I went, everybody got a sticker and just had the most wonderful time. The funnest conversations talking about butterflies. I saw you doing that. I remember you doing that. You, you seemed incredibly active during COVID on, uh, through uploads on YouTube, like the monkey, the chimp series. And then, uh, you did um, monkey, the chimp. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was, yeah, that was, a, that was part of that experiment. I, I, um, like I histories, started, uh, history huh? lessons too, right? Alternate history. Was that uh, something like that? Did or, I, I did, I did some art shows and things yeah. like that. Not art shows, but art classes, um, on, on, online. I just monkey the chimp. I thought it was great. Thank you. I, I love <laughs> monkey the chimp. I, that was my, uh, that was something I, re- I was really interested in, um, which started with the Red Planet Planning Commission was doing um, uh, multi-pan, like stationary multi-panel animation. Um, and so it began with that and Monkey the Chimp. And then when I did back to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to finish your question that I was asked a while ago. Um, Cultured Cell Culture was created so I would have a performance that I could do while I was running my bike from Maine to Florida. Okay. And it touches on a lot of the things. It touches on a lot of ecology stuff and butterflies and things like that. But it's a fiction. It's I'm trying to promote um, cruelty-free cannibalism for the advancement of the human species. Right. And, that uh, was that was sort of one of my questions in watching Deep Astronomy and Cultured Cell Culture is how much you you play yourself in Deep Astronomy, but how much of that is you? And how much of that is a character? Oh. I, you know, I, I act differently on stage. I, I think we all do, you know? Um, sure. Of course. Yeah. But, uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's half re conceived and, and, and half reflex. Um, but, uh, but culture, so culture, the, the entire, it's, it's 20, 28 minutes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all done in front of a multi panel, uh, stationary multi-panel uh, animation piece, right? That has its own music and animation, and and I would talk over it in in sync with it. Yeah, I, I wondered if that was being done. If somebody was controlling the advancement of the, <laughs> the parts, it, it was just because the sync was so was so good, or if you had Thank just you. rehearsed it. Yeah, it was a lot of rehearsing, and um, okay, and a uh, couple little like I would wear cues uh audio cues in my ears so that i was always in time um mm. and also one of the things i love about that is blue boy that old painting yes. <laughs> blue boy. i think he the reason i chose blue boy was when i was a little kid my uncle had a um had a uh big print of blue boy and pinky outside of his bathroom and i was terrified of blue boy like there was just <laughs> something about his face that just freaked me out so whenever I'd leave the bathroom, I'd have to like close my eyes and flick off the light and just run, <laughs> you know, to get out of there. So, so recently I, I was thinking, you know what, I haven't seen that Blue Boy painting in my adult life. And I looked at it, I'm like, that's pretty cool. I'm, he's going to be my sidekick. And now you'll uh, use him. 
<laughs> yeah, me and Blue Boy, man, we we've, we've done a few things. I read but, that uh, you would spend a lot of your summers like at your grandparents, fairly isolated. Yeah, yeah. Um, in uh, Nevada, they had um, they lived in a mobile home out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, in fact, my son, uh, my my youngest, has had to interview me uh, today, and he asked me. He said, "You know, tell me a story from your childhood." And so I told him about a time when uh, my grandmother, uh, she came in, she goes, Tink's got a rattler. And uh, she had a cat named Tinkerbell. <laughs> and there was a rattlesnake under a rock. And so she had this big old white cat like jumping around in this rock, just going totally, you know, berserk. And so my grandmother, you know, said, Gra- grab a pistol. So I took a gun <laughs> and uh, I went out and my grandma, she goes, okay ready and she like took a, a rake and flipped this huge rock over backwards and this big rattlesnake coiled up and i shot its head off so i said wow. that was the day that me and my or my grandmother and her cat and i killed a rattlesnake right outside of her door so yeah i had That's fun in the yeah my grandma she was I, I was nuts about her she was great i just, i when i read that about you though it was in an old article a while ago but it just made me think i i could be wrong but you seem so imaginative and that like had to have have some contribution to that like just filling your days with play in a way you know what i used to love to do when i was a teenager in nevada dig a hole like i just i'd go out there and, and there was a hole that i had dug the year before and it was this big deep hole but when I went back out, it did kind of like halfway filled in. I'd be like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I'd get a shovel and go out. My grandma would bring me iced tea and I'd just be out just trying to dig the biggest hole as I could before summer vacation ended. <laughs> Something wrong with a nice hole. To dig. I, 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 I love to dig muddy holes until I started hitting worms as a child. And then I kind of, <laughs> I kind of start checked out of that whole thing. Yeah. You've, they're, they're, uh, if you, if you have emotional feelings for worms, you're not, the, uh, it'll definitely, uh, just, dis- they'll dissuade you. <laughs> I've been trying you know, to, th- oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say, I've been trying to think of a way to describe what deep astronomy is. And it, cause it, it's a, it's a road show. It's part documentary. It's very meta, but it's also like, you're seeing the movie being made as it's being made. We well, you know, I, all I, of it. I, 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 and this is this is me personally, you know, uh, thinking about this. But it's a very different kind of film. It is, and, and it, the uh, in fact, I, I was with uh, Trent Harris, who is a filmmaker who did uh, the uh, Beaver trilogy. Um, and Trent, he watched it at a. It wasn't completely done. It was sort of a test screening in um, the Boulder, Colorado, at the university there. Uh, we showed it to a very small group and uh he said i kept waiting for it to become a normal narrative but once i realized <laughs> once i realized that wasn't going to happen i sat back and enjoyed it yeah and, that was that yeah. was kind of my experience yeah like the first 10 minutes when is <laughs> when is this going to come together but yeah. I, it comes I mean, together it comes, thematically kind of at the end like the whole thing wraps around and yeah, it's 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 it's, a, it's its own kind of story, and and one of the things that I've I've been thinking about is um, the reason it's so different is because not only was the technique different, but the intention was different. Um, most people, when they make films, they're following similar intentions. You know, they want the film to make a lot of money or, or something like that. And if you take money completely out of the film and make it about uh, a shared experience among as many strangers as could possibly be interested in participating and then giving it to everybody at the end. Um, it becomes a whole different, uh, project. It becomes, it, it's, it's not chasing the buck. It's not chasing any of the same in, in incentives. Okay. And so the uh, end product is different. So the, the open that, sort of collaboration aspect is part of why you've just released it for free. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable yeah. making money off everybody else. I mean, they all signed releases, which just made it to where I could do this, you know? Um, but, uh, usually the releases mean I can, you know, go out and sell it, but 
it, it made right. there was a little bit of money that it made um from some screenings but those went toward the i butterfly tour and uh also a couple of submission fees for festivals so it paid for itself you know it's always paying itself forward now have you tried putting this film and your other films on streaming services it seems hard to find a lot of your work um well the old films used to be in every streaming service uh but the producer who is kind of the manager of those those titles um i i think he just you know he just let him go let the let the contracts expire Okay. And uh, moved on to do different things. Is that uh, like? Does that frustrate you as a <laughs> as a creator? Or it's to, to have your really. work hard to find, or no? I'm I'm always you know. I mean, I'm I, I would love for people this who would like the projects to find them, but um, but I'm also uh, you know, the, I've I've I I have to pick my battles and. Sure. It's it's whether it's uh, preserving the past or trying to create something new, and so uh, you know I I try to put my uh, my efforts towards making something that I haven't seen before. Well, you always give us that. You're always <laughs> looking forward and doing something completely different and in the best way. I have to say. Oh, thank you. You know, I wrote a new screenplay. Um, I I wrote it. I I got. Uh, I, I was at the uh, Sci-Fi London uh, Festival uh, with um, Deep Astronomy and the Romantic Sciences, and uh, for some reason, I just I was just in a funk. You know, I was just in a bad mood. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of depression flying around these days, and you know, it it is a yeah. contagious disease um, or condition. And so, uh, so I was just feeling bad, and so I went to London. And the only way I could get there, I, I got a cheap ticket for, but I had to stay for five nights and the festival was going to put me up for two nights. And so I thought, well, I'll just, I'll bring my tent in, in a backpack and rent a bike and just ride off to the country and go, go camp out for three nights. And, uh, so that's what I did. And while I was there at this place called Morley's farm where I, I, I camped, uh, they charge you like 12 bucks a night. It's beautiful. Um, there was like this ancient little shed and I sat in there and started writing this screenplay, uh, which was sort of based on the idea that it was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky. How could I be sad? You know? And so I ended up writing this thing called the laughing beast and, oh, that's right. Yeah. Your book. Uh, yeah. Well, I put it out as a book because, you know, I mean, there, I may never be able to make another film. It's, it's very difficult to get a production started yeah and i wanted people to get to know it and if it does become a film just having knowledge of it and knowing the story and watching it evolve uh will let people who you know bought the book and read it become a part of it you know they're they're, they're participants because they know what it is yeah. is it is this uh more of a traditional narrative or is it no, I released it as a screenplay um, in a in okay. a book form. That's something I I've, I have two books out on. They're self published on Amazon. Um, the the reason I do it that way is because, I mean, the traditional way before this model uh, happened was you get a bunch of money and then you order five hundred books and then you have yeah. them sitting in your house <laughs> and you try to sell them. Um, Print the demand is a life changer. It really is. So I have two books I've got, and you can find them. Uh, they're on Amazon, or you can go find them at uh, redplanetplanningcommission.com. Um, they're uh, the uh, one's three dimensional losers, and one is uh, the screenplay of the Laughing Beast. And three three dimensional losers is sort of your like text form of of the sort of seminars you were giving in deep astronomy, and that right. Yeah, yeah. The the uh you know, Deep Astronomy is a ninety minute film and it only has these little excerpts mm -hmm. from lectures. And so, you know, like but Deep Astronomy the lecture is a ninety minute lecture. So there's a lot of information that isn't in the film. So I thought I'll I'll share the lectures as um and, and other, you know, some other material too. Share them as um um in in their entirety. 
uh, in in, yeah. in in text, so people can see what that was. And there's also other things. I know there's there's one story that I really love, which was another thing that I uh, was doing during COVID. I was I was trying to entertain people online, and uh, I wrote this thing called Finale, uh, which is about the last clown. Right, and I love it. You love Finale. I love Finale. Thank if you. If you look it up I on wondered. Facebook, uh, <laughs> my comment is there. On day. Facebook, yeah. I wonder right. what that last clown thing was about. Oh, right well, it, during the introduction. Yeah, yeah it's it's a, um, um, yeah. I, I I like the tagline I wrote for it. It says, um, uh, "When a clown gives his life for years, the least you could do is smile." Um, <laughs> and the uh, it it's about this. You know how um. There's a there's there's a thing called ecofunction, like the um, Tasmanian tiger wolves, um, the, that went extinct in the 30s. They looked like wolves. They acted like wolves. They, you know, hunted like wolves. But they were close, more closely related to kangaroos. They were marsupials. But right. they developed in a place where there was nothing to take on that particular role. So they became them. And so the idea with finale is that there's these, this kind of people that developed separate from uh, humans. And one of the things about them is that their blood is copper-based. So their blood's actually blue. And like the uh, horseshoe crabs that we have, they have blue blood. And they're routinely... Um, uh, hunted for their blood because it, it's an incredibly powerful antibiotic and it also keeps um blood from coagulating so um and clotting so the idea is this clown he's the last one of his kind and his parents his mother knew he was going to be the last so she named him finale and uh he's uh, being hunted for his blood during a time of a of a plague and so he's kind of got to come to terms with whether or not he's going to go surrender himself to be basically <laughs> milked for the rest of his life in a strapped to a bed, or if he's just going to stay on the run. It's very good. It's essentially a one act play and it's one long monologue. Yeah. Yeah. Telling his story. Um, yeah. I like finale. That's that the book starts with that. And there's some lyrics and other, other pieces in there. Uh, I wanted to mention, I was looking, I was scrolling through your Patreon and I, I saw you had that video about you have the extra three pages or something at the end of three dimensional losers for, for the readers to, you know, to leave notes to, to whoever gets the book next. I, I just think that's, I think that's a great idea. I've like, I read a lot of books from age five to 17 and I'm kind of trying to get back into it in my forties. So I've been buying a lot of used books. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I, I got a like a compilation of '60s science fiction, and the the previous owner, you know, 50 years ago or whatever, had uh, just took their own notes on like what <laughs> what the themes of the stories were, and that like s some of the stuff I didn't connect with, they like their notes would would kind of help me connect with the story more. So I, I just thought that was a great idea. Thanks. I, well, the 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 books when I got them, they had extra pages on the back, and I thought, mm -hmm. you know, people could, uh, you know, if they, they they could sign their name and date it, and then hand it to a friend and say, you know, just keep passing them on. And so there would be this uh, registry in the back of the book. Um, one thought I had was uh, it, it kind of reminded me a little bit, a little bit of um, uh, hobo tagging. Uh, there's this thing that a friend of mine, um, Bill Daniels, did a documentary on uh, a lot, long time ago. Uh, but he followed uh, hobo taggers. And what would happen is a train would pull up into a town and the hobos would write their names on it. And then the train would go to the next town. And sometimes if uh, you know they knew somebody died, they would like repair their tag and you know add a little couple dots to it to say that it was them who did it, you know, kind of thing. Uh -huh. So the idea of the, the book cruising around and making these rounds and everybody tagging it, you know, and putting their info in it, that was kind of fun. I think it was, I think it's a great idea to, to add on to a book. 
Uh, I've had yeah. a copy of For Whom the Bell Tolls, like fill up someone's notes <laughs> throughout it. <laughs> Just kind of cool. Yeah, I've, I've, um, my wife writes all over books. She's, it's tons of notes. So, you know, if anybody should ever come across one of her books, there will be Would a narrator. Like, what has she written? Throw it out here. Would you like to? I don't know. She's she just you know she she makes little notes all over her books. This oh, I thought, you, was... I thought you meant like she's written books. Sorry, well. I wish she would. <laughs> she's... I was gonna say, <laughs> could you and, go uh, ahead and drop a title? Uh, nah, she's smarter than me. She's. I always I always tell young men. I'm like, if you should choose to get married, marry somebody smarter than you. There's no reason that you should get the short end of that stick. Good advice. Yeah. So you can always go to someone to ask for advice. Yeah, make them make the make the somebody has to win, right? right. Let it let it be you. Uh, I'm I'm curious that do you have like much of a background in theater before doing these stage performances? I, I know um, you you would make short films with your band and things like that, but were you like ever part of a, a troupe or did you ever do a stage show with other people? I I did. Um, well, I, I worked in nightclubs in San Francisco uh, throughout the '90s. I was I was the head of security at a few big clubs, um, and uh, a lot of the other um, security people were also musicians and performers. So sometimes we would anonymously do shows together, um, and you know, it depended on who was putting it together as to who would be the one calling the shots. I also uh, was in, I think, the first actual play that I was in. I, I played Pontius Pilate in Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh, cool. And Yeah, oh, that was great. And uh, such such amazing music, too, in that one. It's, it's really fun. Um, and then uh, I've done, I've just done little things here and there. One, one thing that I, I think about often, um, I was hired as a musician uh, to play auto harp at the Lincoln Center in a Chinese opera. And uh, there was a director who was doing two versions. One was a traditional Chinese, um, like traditional Chinese version of this thousand year old opera. And then the other was a half westernized version uh, of the same opera. Um, and uh, I was the only Western instrument, the auto harp. I was playing with a, uh, who, people from the Beijing Music Conservatory and they were amazing, amazing. So, uh, actually, Miss Min um, played Peepaw in one of the episodes of Stingray Sam. Okay. When they're, talk when they're talking about the saints of ancient China. You could hear her. She was, uh, that's how I met her was at the um, The Orphan yeah, of I was, Zhao. Was I was just was wondering for, you know, had you done plays? Were you were you a Shakespeare person? Things like that. Uh, no, just just different things. You know, if, if somebody invited me, I'd say sure. And uh, I like know, that. that. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> you you seem to be that type of person. I I've read too where you uh, attribute labels to yourself because it seems more professional. Is that inaccurate? Um, I I I I I always I don't know like. Because I, I rest, people don't get it. If you just say like the paint, you have to call yourself a painter type of thing. Well, you know, that one of the things I, I only call myself an artist when I'm being lazy, you know, okay. um, <laughs> but, but I, I always like right now I'm doing illustrations. I'm, um, I started this book called rabbit about nine years ago and um, thought I'd be done with it in six months. But after two years, I was halfway through it and I had to take a break and I started Captain Ahab's motorcycle club. Um, but uh the um so now when people say oh what do you do i say oh i'm an illustrator right because i'm doing illustrations but um yeah the whole art thing was something i always struggled with because you know i was growing up people would say uh um like i don't know it was like people would say things like um um you know, they go, what, what do you do? And, and I tell them, you know, I'm drawing and painting and, and they go, Oh, you're an artist. I'm an artist too. You know? 
and and then there was this kind of like you know aren't we special kind of thing yeah and i just and i, I didn't get it you know and <laughs> and then uh and 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 then then i realized I, I was struggling with it and a friend of mine who i could consider an artist um an amazing painter he's a um paints birds and his name's uh david tom i grew up with him i've known him since i was 12 and uh he uh he once said to me, he said, uh, well, art is something that, you know, it touches you um, deep inside. And my wife, uh, Amy, said, she goes, well, art is, make, art, art make, is something that makes you look up from your circumstances. Hmm. And uh, so I thought for me to say I'm an artist is for me to say, I can touch something in you deep inside and make you look up from your circumstances, you know. And so, so I thought, well, yeah, I did. I, I couldn't say that, you know, and also the, there's there's something about um, your work like, does do that though. I'm just letting you know it does make us well, think and, thank you. and feel things. Well, I mean that's that's for you to say though, right? I mean it's not for yeah, me to course, say, of course, right? Right? Yeah, you, yeah. It's, it's like it, oh, really? You didn't feel anything looking at my work? You just don't get it. You're not <laughs> right, on my right. level, you know that kind of stuff. Oh, and also like there was you know when I made the the deep um small star seminar um I, re I i did that in two months and it's my favorite record and um the uh but there were people who uh you know i mean it, it, it to me it was fun and interesting but there were people who took it seriously and people who didn't take it seriously but it still worked on them as a as like a self-help thing hmm. and and uh the people who took it seriously when they'd hear me talking about it they're like i'm really surprised to hear you say that yeah. Um, yeah. but uh but but that was the thing is it touched them where they were in their life dealing with what they were dealing with and then he, here comes some information here comes some ideas and it made sense to them on a in a certain way that wasn't for right. me to say you know yeah one guy one guy said um the reason that the small star seminar was the reason he didn't commit suicide when he found out he had this this disease, uh, I won't go too into it, but you know, I didn't write it for that, right? You know, and, and I was surprised to hear that. You know, so I mean, it's not propaganda. I'm not telling people what to think, right? I, I, a lot of your uh, work seems to be sort of humanist, though, like that you have like an understanding of of mankind. At least this is what I get out of it. That you you seem to understand people a lot and have some sort of optimism for humanity's future in a way, despite well, our you. short fallings and shortcomings. Well, I I have my I have my optimistic moments. Well, I was going to say, yeah. does that feeling come and go? And like, has that been something since you've held since childhood? Is that like a something? Well, you know when. Whenever I try to write something from a dark place, it it, sound, it looks like propaganda. Okay, you know, it's it looks like it looks like I'm trying to tell people what to think. It's too pointed and and ugly and shallow. Um, but actually, you know, um, you asked what films I I liked, and I I said yes. Re recently, I watched The Deer Hunter twice, two right. nights in a row, which you know that movie is not that funny. <laughs> no, it's not that. No, no, but, uh, that one. No, but but the thing that really surprised me. I mean, I saw it when I was a teenager. Um, they didn't tell you what to think. Right. Ever. Right. No, they never. You know, took you by the nose and showed you showed you what it was you were supposed to be looking at. They never gave you an opinion. Um, and then I tried to watch Saving Private Ryan, <laughs> just <laughs> out of the get go. They're going to tell you what to think and feel, you know. Um, yeah, it's much more. Uh, I'm trying to think of the proper word. Heart wrenching uh, and, propaganda. Schmaltzy. Yeah. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> I like yeah. to say. There's no room for yeah, yeah. But and also in the Deer Hunter too. One thing that really kind of surprised me was there's there's only one real battle scene and it's really brief, and. People, you know, the, the the only person of the cast who dies, uh, it dies um, playing, um, you know, commits suicide. Right. And, and but everybody's lives are just totally destroyed by this war, even though nobody died in it. Mm -hmm. 
you know it's a really interesting film it's it's really really deep and it's deeper because it doesn't tell you what to think i need to rewatch it i haven't seen it since my teenage years either and i'm i'm younger than both of you i'm only in my early 30s but i i need to go back to it i watched the ghost of mrs uh muir on your uh recommendation i love that that was the first Thank time you. i've ever seen it it's um, really great right it is rex harrison's voice is fantastic this, oh, yeah. his whole performance um yeah, everything about that film I've I've loved. I've I've seen the Ghost and Mrs. Muir for those for you l- listeners out there. It's uh, <laughs> not not the TV show that came out in the sixties. This was from the forties. It stars Rex Harrison and Gene Tierney and uh, George Saunders, yes. and it's it's wonderful. And uh, I'm bad with names. I, I don't sound bad with names because I just said three. But uh, the cinematographer is amazing. And uh, the music, too. The music was by the guy who did all the music for uh, Alfred Hitchcock films. He did Psycho and oh, all that I stuff. That. Yeah. Um, it, so it's, it looked very modern, like the shot lies in it. It looked, you know, really good. Yeah, there's a wonderful, there's a wonderful shot um, where the ghost first comes to visit her when she's sleeping. Yes, through the window and everything. Right, and it pans around the room and then... And also, like the very simple things that they would do, like when he uh, he exposes himself to her, when the ghost shows himself to her for the first time in the kitchen. Yeah, and in the shadows. Yeah, and and he goes light the candle, and so <laughs> he lights the candle, and basically he you. It's not like he goes and appears. She lights a candle, and there he is standing in the shadows of a corner. You know, it's very organic. I love that. I I love the movie, but I will also say like it is a very depressing, <laughs> like out of nowhere it seems like that that last little like twenty minutes is just heart wrenchingly sad, all because of George Sanders. Yeah, yeah, it's a tragic movie. Yeah. Oh, and that little girl too. That's Natalie Wood. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, I mean, thank you for recommending that. I did not check out the documentaries that you had uh, suggested. Um, oh, Adam but, Curtis. I've been watching. Yeah. Um, I love Adam Curtis. He's. Uh, I, when COVID started, I was supposed to go lecture at a university and uh, at uh, Lancaster. And the professor, uh, John Modern, said, it, watch uh, uh, The Century of the Self by adam curtis it's a you know a series that's what my students are watching and that way you can talk to them about it and i watched it like three times in a row it's it was just so good and fun and you know i just love the way he put everything together um i consider him to be one of my favorite filmmakers he, uh adam curtis does i heard in an in interview doesn't call himself a filmmaker he calls himself a uh, journalist hmm. um okay. but but his forms of journalism like uh what's the one um can't get you out of my head they're all about seven hours long um in their series you know they're like an hour each but um i mean hour an episode but seven episodes and um can't get you out of my head is um, an emotional history of the 20th century so it's a history of the 20th century through emotions through shared emotions and the way he uses music and everything and has these little patient uh, breaks where it'll just be music and imagery. It's it's amazing. And then after that, he did one um, came out at the end of last year called uh, Trauma Zone, where he doesn't narrate, uh, which I love his narration, but it totally works without it. Where he shows what it felt like to live through the collapse of communism and uh, democracy in Russia from. Uh, 1985 to 1999 and yeah and it's just it's all images it's i mean not images but you know i mean sound and music and stuff but um there's no narration from anyone you mean well there's there's text to let you know um you know what's happening at that particular time like um but it's but it's a real collage of stuff like it'll be um you know people being killed in a war um somebody out working in a field uh 
the astro the cosmonaut in the uh, space station and and uh, you know some made for TV uh, Soviet version of Lord of the Rings and all these things <laughs> just all mixing together and showing how things fell apart. You know, it's really good. Um, it sounds interesting. Yeah, that was the one that kind of jumped out at me on his on the list of his works as being particularly. Of well, I, I, it is interesting. It's super interesting. I, I always recommend uh, Century of the Self for people who want to as a good introduction. Um, the uh, I think his masterpiece, in my my opinion, might be well that, but I I think more so just sort of artistically. I think. Um, can't get you out of my head uh is just the way it's put together is just so brilliant oh he's also got another one called um uh hyper normalization which is also really good it's right in between those two so i recommend them you know i'll it, have to check them out if, yeah. if you're looking for something to explore you know those are, those are really good his use of music is amazing too I'm looking over some of my notes, uh, and you were you were discussing a bit of depression when you were writing your screenplay, and just a little bit of that seems to shine through somewhat through cultured cell culture, just the whole stepping out of the crowd. And I, I wrote down while watching it, like I myself, I feel like I go back and forth on being a part of the world and wanting to like just withdraw completely. Like I can never decide because the way things oh. are, I don't know. Well, well, cultured cell culture. I was uh, in that. I was I was playing with, um, you know, there 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 are so many snake oil salesmen yeah. in the world right now, and some of them will be these, you know, like the most brilliant scientists in their field, and they'll talk about things that you that are actually affecting you, and you'll be going, "Oh my gosh, yes." And then you know, after a, a forty five minute lecture, they'll try to sell you some skin cream. Or something, right. and uh, that's made of some ancient mud that has, you know, <laughs> the, the decayed DNA of this, you know, like. And so I started watching those, and and so I, when I wrote Cultured Cell Culture, I wanted to talk about everything. I mean, uh, not everything, but a lot of things that are actually a problem. And so it draws you in with: Are you depressed? Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? And, but it goes on and on. Like it basically, I mean, it, it's got to hit almost everybody. Right. It, it, huge <laughs> envelope. Yeah. Somebody's in there, you know? And so, so it draws you in that way. And, and the whole thing is, you know, that we've evolved, uh, into the crowd. Now we're no longer individuals. We're now the crowd. And this is a new thing. And so it starts talking about, you know, the collapse of people's, uh, psyche as 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 a result and then at the very end the whole selling point is you'll never be alone you know right like so it, yeah like so you'll be in the crowd even though you're trying to escape the crowd and get yeah. your individuality i that it's uh i love it and then it's it's hard to tell it's a bit of satire but there's a little bit of truth to it yeah there's a lot of science in there and a lot of uh a lot of uh, tragic science that's you know going on today too, just sprinkled in there. Which is another thing yeah. too that is what these snake oil people use. You know, like they they'll bring up some terrible environmental thing that's happening and tell you a new piece of information about it, and you'll be like, "Oh my god, thank you!" And then you know, try to try to sell you some crap. I uh, I remember reading on your site that's factual functional fiction for a lot of yeah your that, work and. I, it's a new genre in a way. Yeah. Breaking yeah, yeah. ground. Yeah. yeah someday um, somebody will get rich off it. I'm sure. Probably. <laughs> and that's kind of one of the themes in deep astronomy, right? Just everybody getting, getting rich other than you, <laughs> sort of your character. Yeah. Well, I like that, that idea of, I mean, it, it talks about different ideas. Um, being used differently like one person uh is selling oh, what is it um i forget the word the blink it's... time the time control or <laughs> yeah no the uh they're selling um oh they're 
perception management, right? Which is actually a, a, right, it's yeah. an actual phrase. And so, so you know, here's a comedian getting up on stage and doing these like art performances and stuff, and then somebody takes ideas from those and tries to twist them as something that you need, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of different um, ways of looking at things, sort of peppered through that film. It's a very deep film. It's I, I keep thinking about the themes and just things within it, and uh, I love the the made of light, all that. Um, you seem to have space just on your mind. Did you read a lot of sci-fi as a child or watch no, science I ne- fiction? I never read as a kid. I, I in <laughs> fact. I um I was illiterate until I was about twenty four, I guess. I don't know. Um then I then I started trying. Um but uh yeah, I, I used I used to just sit in a rocking chair and uh drink coffee and listen to really loud headphones and that <laughs> and, and and think and fantasize. And that's that's how I uh ended up learning how to play music even. You know, just just wow. listening and absorbing. I was like, gestating. I, I well, was I was not ready. <laughs> from what I take from again, I said this a little bit earlier. But I guess I wrote it twice, but in a different way. Is that like we need to love ourselves before we can like go to the heavens, like thematically? Um, seems to be running through all of your stuff. I don't. I like. Oddly spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. <laughs> I don't know. If that's that's the how, and like I don't always take away that from things, but I do with like deep astronomy. Well, there's 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 real, you know, there's there's some things in there that I that I you know some things I wrote because I thought they were funny, and and some things I wrote because there were things I was actually thinking about, you know, right. Um, like when my when my mother was passing away, I talked about that a little while ago about how I you know was paying attention to uh, uh, green burial. Uh, I I would I was sitting next to her uh, for a few nights and trying to just find different perspectives, uh, things that I didn't think about before. And and one of the perspectives that I share in deep astronomy is the idea of um, reflective light being forever and so those moments that you shared as a baby with your mother um when you were reflecting light there's they're still traveling through space so those moments actually still exist that's a that's a nice piece in in the film but it was you know i thought of it while i was sitting next to my mom you know so um, i thought it was very beautiful thank you I, i i i like I like to think about, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm always trying to think of, to, to find something that I haven't thought of or heard before, you know, um, for just as a challenge to myself. Yeah. I thought I, that the, uh, the, your early lecture about the light we don't absorb, we reflect. And then that, yeah. that came full circle with, uh, Rudy to Jesus's, did I say that right? <laughs> like final yeah. little monologue about uh, you just trying to put more love into the world than you take. And for me, that's, that's how that's, <laughs> that was the circle of the theme in the film. And I thought, I thought Rudy was really great in his parts. Oh, that makes me so happy to hear you say that. I love Rudy. Um, I met him uh, at the, um, at the corner. Uh, there's a, there's a bodega that I, go to every night and for about you know four or five minutes i just you know i'm talking to whoever's in there and and just always have a a a lovely time and one night rudy was in there and that's where we we met and uh every time we'd see each other we would just stand on the corner and talk for like an hour or two and so when i was writing deep astronomy i had all this footage that i was trying to work with but i kept writing the same thing and it wasn't very good um like the narrative structure. It wasn't very good. And I was just working with all that live stuff yeah. and trying to write something else. So I thought, okay, 
I'm, I'm failing because, you know, every time I sit down at this piano, my hands go to the same keys. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I thought, all right, what's the opposite of what I would do? And I thought, um, whatever's popular, you know? And so I thought, well, what's popular? And I realized I'd seen a lot of things with, uh, lady robots in them. <laughs> That's really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, this is my my yeah. reaction to it was like I've I've seen a lot of lady robots lately. I, <laughs> yeah, and, and I I think mine is probably the cheapest. <laughs> Just yeah, yeah, purely on a budgetary sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she, yeah, but but actually, I th I think mine's probably the mo most accurate too. Uh, right. But uh, and so then I thought, all right, well, who do I like? And then I thought, well, I like Rudy. You know, this guy who I see sometimes on the corner and, you know, we hang out and talk. I like him. So I'm going to write a story about Rudy and this robot. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote the whole narrative pretty quickly based on that idea. And then when I went and, and I had it in my head when I started that I was going to rewrite it several times thinking of different people in that part. But I just liked Rudy so much in this as the idea. I saw him one night and I said, Rudy, you don't know me that well. Um, but, uh, I make movies and I know you're a hip hop performer. Uh, so, you know, you're used to performing. Would you ever be interested in, uh, trying to act in a film? And he said, yeah. And I said, okay. Cause I wrote a story about you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, so, so he came, so we met for breakfast a couple of times and talked about it. And then, um, he'd come over and we would work on the script and just had a blast every time, you know, just had, had the best time. And, um, I remember somebody uh, close to me going, so you don't know this guy? He's not an actor and you're going to make him your lead in your film? And I'm like, yeah, I, I think he's going to be great. I mean, if if people see him the way I see him, they're going to love him, you know? And then uh, that person met him and said, yeah, he's yeah, he's he's it. Yeah, he was he's good. Cool. Yeah. Okay, I would have... I would have gone on the rest of my life assuming that he just was sort of rolled in with the whole collaborative <laughs> group, but that's that's really interesting. That's yeah, no, he was, he was he was he was he was somebody who had, you know he's part of part of my uh, my corner store wow. you know where I go to buy you beer just and find I, people and then pull them in. You know, there, there's a lot of nice people out there. Um, in fact, that was the one thing I took away from my uh, two thousand mile bicycle ride was how many nice people there are. There's a lot of. I mean, every now and then you'd meet a jerk, right? But sure. Usually no, and. And, you know, it's, and, and you'd be hanging out with people who, you know, politically, fundamentally the, are the exact opposite of you, but you'd all be having a really nice time, you know, yeah. which seems unlikely when you, you know, when you're, when you're on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. When you're plugged in too much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I was, I, there's all these little different things. I can tell you two very different, nice moments. Um, one was I, I was looking at my GPS over the side of this freeway and this guy in this big muscle car shoots across traffic. There wasn't much traffic, so it's fairly deep, but shoots across the road, gets to a halt next to me. And he's like this big muscly dude. And he goes, where the hell are you going? And I said, I started in Maine. I'm going to Florida. And he goes, God damn. And he puts out his fist and I open my hand. And he gives me five bucks and then just <laughs> skids away. Cool. You know? And there was another time when uh, uh, there was this old older woman and she was uh, sweeping up a gas station parking lot. And she's like, where are you going with all that? And I'm like, oh, here. And I gave her a sticker, you know, and because uh, I gave everybody stickers. I gave her a sticker and she's and I explained the whole butterfly thing. And she leaned on her broom and she goes, when are you going to move to North Carolina where you belong? <laughs> what is that supposed to mean it was a compliment <laughs> right yeah. he's from north carolina she wants to stick around the sweet yeah hearts. yeah so you know i mean it was it was it was beautiful it was beautiful it was the funny thing is like i i always when when people would ask me they're like you know how is it i go oh, it's fun and then i'd be like wait no wait it's not fun you know right it's, but it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile. Um, right. That was something a, a friend of mine said once. Uh, he was talking about a girl he was in love with, and he said, uh, "You know, 
he goes, she's worth your time. He goes, that's, that's not, it doesn't have anything to do with beauty or intelligence or, or, in, or cleverness, anything. Being worth your time is a quality all its own. And uh, that's how I felt about this trip was it had a quality all its own. It was, and that quality was, it was just worth your time. Yeah. And time is our most valuable resource these days. Yeah. And people would ask me too, they'd go, what's it like? And I'd say, you know what? Right now it's, it's like standing here talking to you yesterday. feels like a million years ago. I'm going to have to go home and just think about it for a few weeks and then I'll be able to figure out what it was like. <laughs> I've had that, uh, similar experiences, but hiking like a long trek and then like you're kind of hating it in the moment and then you think about it later you yeah sit on it the people you meet and everything yeah you know when i was a kid i used to like i used to like to remember things more than i enjoyed being a part of them hmm. um, that's, that's a wild know? way to phrase it but it, it there's i like it yeah I, I remember like as a kid being on a, on a on a beach and there was a bunch of new young people there i was you know like a young teen and uh, everything was just so wonderful, but I couldn't wait for it to end so I could just go home and sit in my rocking chair and think about it. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's where I owned it, you know. That's where right. I, that's where I could, I could, I could sort of shape it a little bit, you know. I mean, how do you keep going in life and keep creating? Is it is oh. it compulsive? Like, what, what makes you? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm 62. Um, I've been, uh, you know, uh, like I'm, I'm really happy that I did that bike ride because, you know, I'm sure in 40 years I won't be able to do that. Right. <laughs> but the, uh, but, but I, I mean, you know, nothing, nothing that I've ever done has been, you know, what uh, successful people would call successful. But to me, these things are hugely successful. Um, you know, like that bicycle ride, I got people to plant milkweed. You know, I got people talking about butterflies. I, 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 it, it, it worked. Everything worked. But it was, you know, on a hand, you know, on a, on a, on a hand to hand level, you know, yeah, intimate you know. level. Yeah, very intimate level. But it, but everything worked. And the same with deep astronomy and the romantic sciences. You know, it's not going to win an Academy Award, but it worked. It absolutely worked. So that's that's that that's you know, it's a, it's a it's not it's not a corporate definition of success, right? Um, it's not a capitalist definition of success. It's it's success on its own terms. I think even you know this goes for all people out there. Just like trying and even finishing a project is pretty successful. Oh, finishing it is the sanity, you know, right. starting it is nuts, but finishing the project is where you go, see, yeah. you know, and actually that's why I'm going back to rabbit. Well, the, the book I'm illustrating, I've got a long way to go. Um, but I want to, I got to finish it. I have to, um, otherwise are you, are you allowed to talk about, is it going to be a children's book? Is it just a, it... Oh, if you go to my Patreon page, I'm, I'm starting to, to re, uh, repost the old pages so they'll all be in the same spot like i've done okay. about 100 pages i'm going to do about 120 150 more um Damn. and uh the first pages too like i just started cranking through it like just drawing i didn't have a particular style in mind on the first pages so you can actually watch the evolution of the illustrations as it as it continues and it starts to de as as the story develops the style develops which is something I, I figured would happen. Um, but now too, I, I just, you know, I did all those PowerPoint presentations and animation and stuff. So for the past nine years, I've been uh, doing more. So I'm coming back to it with more experience. And the illustration, illustrations that I did for those projects were inspired by where I left off on Rabbit. It's all feeding into each other. It's all feeding into each yeah. other. Yeah, yeah, like a uh, like one of those uh, uh, one of those snakes. One of the <laughs> or, 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 right? The the alchem the alchemy snake. Yeah. Uh, 
have you been reading recently? Are you reading anything? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, just uh, I, drawing. Yeah. Nothing wrong but, with that. <laughs> of course, I, I reread The Laughing Beast like 20 times trying to find all my little flaws. And that's sort of a fantasy story or? Um, yeah, no, it's, a, it's, uh, I mean, more, yeah, <laughs> but it's, okay. it's, uh, it's, yeah, okay, yeah, it's a fantasy. I mean, story. as, as much as American Astronaut is a Western, I guess, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's a, it's, it, to me, I mean, you know, some people may, re- again, you know, it's not propaganda, but s- some people may read it and think, you know, I have no idea what, it, why, you know. He would write this, but it's um, it it's very fitting to me this story in a time where things are changing in unfamiliar and scary ways, and you have to meet these changes with a sense of hero heroism that you haven't seen before. Okay, right. and and so so the story is um. I, I, I tell you what, it's about this, this guy, he's depressed, and he's got a bike and a tent. That's very familiar. And uh, so his wife basically kicks him out of the house, says, you know, go go fight your your battles elsewhere for a while. You know, go, go <laughs> fight the weather. Go fight the traffic. Just don't sit here and mope. And so, uh, so he takes off, and he goes camping and gets basically abducted by insects. And this one very kind insect uh, named Mark too. Um, but uh, what, what the reason they abducted him is because there's this giant ancient arachnid that has reemerged. And once humanity finds out about it, there's going to be all sorts of hell to pay and it's not going to end with the end of that arachnid. Mm-hmm. And so um, the reason they, and this guy, he's older, you know, he's, you know, self-portrait, my age kind of thing. But um, the reason they chose him is because he was the laughing beast. And what that was, was like thousands and thousands of generations ago, their generations, insect generations, there was this beast which was which would torture and kill insects just ruthlessly and relentlessly. And it was him as a, yeah. as a 12-year-old. <laughs> I like this. It, yeah, so he was like this mean little kid who tortured insects. He's legendary. He's he's like this ancient god that was awful. And so they they're trying to employ him to kill this monster. Because nobody else could. That's an amazing hook. Just, uh, Thanks. Yeah. yeah, he he was the laughing beast. This drunken depressed guy in a tent. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you in- intentionally like throughout the American astronaut and uh, Stingray Sam masculinity seems very like strong but positive there's a lot of talk of toxic masculinity these days in media but yours all seems very positive and, and being a man in a very pure way and, and owning it and being heroic but also like a bit of a scoundrel well that that's something i I think about like there's a lot of there's a lot of focus on gender um but there's not a lot of focus on what it means right um you know like what it means to be a man you know you can get some jerk tell you what he thinks it means to be a man you know um like uh oh my god this this is actually i talk about this in in um what is it uh in uh cultured cell culture there's um there's a thing that's happening to not just people, but animals too, where right now, um, like the sperm count of, a of a, you know, man in his fifties is twice of a man in his twenties. And the reason is, uh, plastic, right? constant exposure yeah. to plastic ingesting plastic in fact there's a guy who's like cruising around florida uh measuring alligator penises because they're swimming in plastic 
polluted waters and their penises are shrinking so they can't mate. And uh, yeah, so so it's this thing that's happening, which is happening physically. It's happening, um, you know, like there's all sorts of problems with um, uh, uh, fet fetuses. In fact, like uh, male fetuses, uh, the miscarriage of male fetuses is skyrocketing and it, it all has to do with plastic. And uh, anyway, Tucker Carlson, uh, when he was in doing his thing, he said the reason this was happening was because men's testicles weren't getting enough sunshine and started, <laughs> and, and started selling these lamps that you were supposed to stand, these like tanning lamps for your, for your genitals. Right. So that, that goes back to that thing about the snake oil boys having right. some real information and then just trying to sell you some garbage. You know, yeah, there's there's always been theories about that. I don't know if, you, if you've ever uh, if you ever listened to Art Bell, the the old talk radio host. But oh, yeah, he, he had a guest on one time who suggested that uh, female mitochondria were were hunting down and killing non gay male fetuses. So oh. within 20,000 years, uh, there would be there would be no more men. He had done the math on that. <laughs> so people, <laughs> yeah. people always have different ideas. Well, as long as he did the math, we know we can trust him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, then, the, the, I, for, I forgot why, why we went down that road. Um, about oh, uh, I was masculinity. About masculinity. Cause yeah. I like your view on masculinity because it does seem positive. And I like it the way that you paint men to be. Well, yeah. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's different, you know, I mean, I mean, everybody's different. Like my grandmother, who yeah. I was talking about killing rattlesnakes with, right. you know, she she um, she cooked and did laundry, and you know, was great at it, and that's what she did. And she never swore, but she was also like one of the most amazing human beings I'd ever met, you know. And yeah. and it and it wasn't because she, you know fought her way up to be the first female CEO of right. some huge corporation. You know, she lived her life as an awesome human being and was strong and powerful. And one time I actually, I mean, this is, this is physical strength. It's not necessarily what I'm talking about, but one time I saw her dragging a pickaxe because it was heavy across the ground. There's another snake story and she saw a snake and she flung it and it <laughs> flew and cut the snake in half. <laughs> That's amazing. She was amazing, you know, and she was yeah. also the only person, you know, when I was when I was thirteen years old, uh, the only person who could comfort me when one of my best friends died. You know, she was she was just she was everything. You know, and and that's my grandmother. I mean, my mother too. You know, I've got a lot of amazing people in my life. So so to me, you know, I grew up like that's what it is to be a woman. You know, right? It was was to be just one of the best people you could ever meet you know i mean that's that's but people don't talk about those those kind of roles right now that's not that's not on the uh yeah right. yeah no i just i mean a lot of your work is it, obviously because you, you star in a lot of it so well, yeah I write it from... and, and and i just i just like the way that you portray men i just it's well you know positive. the the ghost and Mrs. Muir. I mean that, you know, Rex Harrison, it's a romantic film, Absolutely. but it's also, it's extremely masculine. Yeah. You know, except for uncle Nettie. He's right. He's, he's just the worst. <laughs> and she even takes on some of his traits and it's, uh, uh I highly suggest everyone to watch that movie. Cause it's, it's yeah. Really she, good. She's she's also you know she's also very liberated and tough you know like a right a, a young woman trying to get her own apartment and yeah she her husband know. dies she goes out on her own yeah in nineteen hundred right know, proving it. herself yeah it's a it's a it's a it's real and and it's fun it is it's so it's so fun but uh, that that was my that was my romantic movie growing up the ghost of Mrs Muir. But well, thank you for saying that about the masculine characters in my, in my films. I I think they're they're um, I think they're interesting. Um, they are. Yeah. Fatherhood, I think, keeps coming back. 
as well. Like yeah, being an American I, astronaut I to some extent and in, in deep astronomy. I, I, Brian Stingray Sam. I post everything as fatherhood because, um, you know, it's usually from uh, like m me being the character. When I write them, I always put myself in the character. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of my mom in those things too. Yeah. I don't think Protective either of us, character. neither of us have seen Crazy and Thief, right? But that's, that's uh, your, have. oh, you I have, have seen, seen that? Crazy and Thief, yes. Okay. Hey, well, thanks for watching that. that yeah, Crazy and Thief Which was, was about stars in space. Sorry to cut you off, but I just wanted yeah. to put that out there. Yes, it is about stars in space. Um, and those are your kids was, um, in there, right? Yeah, it's my kids. I, it was the first time I, I, my first experiment in making a film with no money, uh, with, without a budget. And, uh, I um I was at a point where I was getting kind of nervous, <laughs> I guess, and so I thought, well, if I could make one more film before I die, you know, um, what would it be? And I thought I'd I'd, I'd want to make a a kind film about little kids, you know, and uh, and I think it's a smart film. Like, uh, you get to you get to watch a two year old's mind in yeah. this film, and um. There have been some people who've, you know, were, were fans of my old films, and they'd say that's actually my favorite one of your films. Um, it's was also uh, for me the um, going around touring with it. I, it played at a lot of theaters or uh, festivals, and I did Q and A's, and the Q and A's for that film were the most fun. It's just a blast. Um, uh, you can watch that too. I think still crazyandthief.tumblr.com dot dot com for. But you can you can find it on. It's it's on um, uh, it's on Vimeo. If you go to my Vimeo page, you can find okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that also has because I rewatched it this week. Um, positive masculine character, the giant at the end. You think maybe at first, like, oh, who is this man? He's picking up these children and he's this kind, looking out for them. Doesn't want the police involved to scare them. Things like that. Well, that uh, that's something that that I find a lot. Like. Um, you know, like I've I've gone on, um, I, I've been a chaperone to a lot of elementary school trips, you know, field trips, right? Uh, throughout the years, and there have been times when, you know, like some old lady on a train will get up and go tap somebody and go, "That man's bothering that child," you know, because I'm talking to some kid who I'm taking care of. <laughs> you know, I've I've had that happen a lot, and so when I made the giant, like it's really scary when when you first see him, right? But but he, but what he's doing is the only decent thing a human being could do. It you also know, turns from that point. It's like before that's this kind of whimsy, fantastical movie. And then it becomes real, like ground yeah, really quick. Well, they also meet the Cyclops too. The, right. uh, that, that who's also, you know, I mean, he, he's somebody kids would, should stay away from some, you know, yes. kind of transient looking guy in a park, but he's just some guy. You know, yeah. Not every, not everybody's a danger, right? You know? yeah. 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 The, I, um, I grew up in the huh? '80s with, uh, you know, don't don't talk to strangers and the Satanic Panic. So that's, uh, yeah. I mean, there's so a reason for that. With me. there, right? Yeah, but yeah. it it shouldn't influence your whole life, <laughs> right? But, no, you shouldn't. I mean, you know, you shouldn't live in complete terror uh, otherwise you know you're yeah it, it's like this poison and uh i mean i've met very few truly bad people right right i've met people i don't like <laughs> but <laughs> plenty of those yes yeah. but like purely <laughs> evil or bad bad people yeah yeah so but uh, but yeah, cr crazy and thief. Like the the two male characters are both threats when you first meet them, and then yes. you realize, oh, they're just these guys, who you know. And again, like the giant when he uh, sees those kids, it looks terrifying, but it's a grown man who's driving by and seeing some kids out at a dangerous place on the edge of a freeway. Yeah, and so he goes and gets them. Get some feeds them. Try to tries to get them home. Yeah, go get some feeds them. Calls calls his police friends to tell him. You know, 
Um, but but he seems really freaky just because right. he's there. That's it. Just because he's there. He's the stranger. He's the unknown. Yeah, he's he's, he's been... dangerous stranger. Right. Yeah. But he, once again, he was even kind. As I said, he doesn't want to alert the police. Like doesn't want to scare the children with like flashing yeah. lights and sounds and like handle it delicately and make sure they eat and everything. Um, yeah. That whole script was based on things that the kids said too. Um, I wrote down things that they had said prior and created the story from it and then went out and just watched how things unfolded. And there was just so much magic in that. Um, like, like when they were eating the lemon, yeah. Um, you know, that bee came around and started like bothering them. And yeah. there was this conversation about the bees and then, uh, you know, uh, Johnny, who was too, like trying to hold all the lemon pills while they were, yeah. In his hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny too. Like I gave him subtitles because you know, yes, I, you I, did. Could understand, I could understand what he was saying. And I showed that in theaters and people would say, you know, you didn't need the subtitles. And I'll go, that's because there were subtitles. If there were right. no subtitles, nobody would have any idea what that guy was talking about. <laughs> I, I think the subtitles are brilliant. And again, you probably do need them, but like yeah. with them, they you get it. Yeah, there's li there's all sorts of little quotes too that always people in my family and around me share for that film. Like, uh, I mean, it's it's such a quotable film. Like when he walks up and there's that like burnt chair that looks like it's covered in crap. Right, the and, dirty chair. Yeah, and he comes up and goes, "Ew!" And uh, uh, my daughter turns around and goes, "Don't say ooh to that chair." <laughs> <laughs> and then he wants to touch like the other part. Yeah. Instead, yeah, can I touch Music. that? Yeah, and and their time machine too. I love their time machine. Yeah, they were looking for. Yeah, it has they a found big star it. on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for talking with me about uh, Crazy and Thief. I, I I smile when I talk about that film. It's it's it had a it had a really great run in festivals, and that was also something that I used because it's um, what is it like forty minutes. 45 yeah, minutes? Yeah, not 40 um, minutes. Yeah. 40 or 15. I, I, use, I use that to launch um, Captain Ahab's Motorcycle Club. So oh. I would go around to festivals with it, and then after it's screened, I would do a QA and a and then I would do a, a Captain Ahab's concert. So hmm. I, I mean, It's a hell I of a show. Every, it was a hell of a show. I did it everywhere. I got to go to Estonia and Played in a few cities there and uh, Greece and Italy, and it was all paid for by the festival. So Captain Ahab's Motorcycle Club got um, a big push thanks to Crazy and Thief. Well, I I'm, feel like I have a a big body of work <laughs> to get into. <laughs> thanks to thanks to Count. Thank you, Count. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks to the internet back in the day for promoting your work so heavily when you did Stingray Sam and just everyone being like, you got to watch Stingray Sam and the American astronaut and check out this Corey McApee guy. Cause he's really cool. Well, wow, he thank is. You. Um, well, it was, that, that was, it's, it seems like a hundred years ago that I made the American astronaut, but I recently, I guess a year ago, maybe went to a screening, uh, of a 35 millimeter print, uh, at the Nighthawk cinema in brooklyn and okay. immediately i was you know like like when i watched that film i'm just so proud of everybody you know like every all the musicians all the actors the the, the sets yeah. the props everything i look at those and i'm just like ah oh, i love their i love everybody so much you know like i'm just so proud of everybody who touched that film it's amazing uh i imagine it's gorgeous on film it is but i do not miss film i no. i tell you i i've i threw my back out lugging prints around um i've watched people chop frames out of my film so the next night it's like a little shorter between the uh mm. the real changes mm. you know um i've seen people not know how to use their projectors um one time i went to moscow and showed the film and they weren't expecting a film they were expecting a video so they had to put together a, a, a 35 millimeter projector you could hear it and they didn't have 
the you know the, the there's a plate in the projector that makes the shape of the frame okay and so if you don't have that plate in there to make it look like a movie shape movie right it's a square and so you can see people standing on ladders holding microphones down oh, the over open people's mat, right? faces yeah and yeah. all these russian people like somebody's reading the script in their ears while they're watching this going <laughs> is is this art you know <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm going, nope, just a nightmare. Yeah. That was your first uh, full-length movie, right? First feature, yeah. My my, my first film, film, film yeah. uh, was an animated piece, which was two and a half minutes called Billionaire, and it was all house paint on paper. It was 2,173 paintings, and uh took me about three years to paint it, and it was just grueling and the, but once i saw it on film i was like okay i'm 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 gonna keep doing this you know um then uh i made a somebody i was working at a nightclub and somebody handed me one of those uh fisher price pixel cameras uh, okay. that that did videotaped on um cassette tapes and it looked like really bad lunar footage lunar broadcast footage so i made this thing called the man on the moon which is i mean i'd never seen like a movie that was filmed as a confessional before but it totally made sense so i made this thing and it got is into that, some is that the one where you're yelling at santa at one point at santa yeah are you yelling at santa in that at all there's some santa stuff in there it's very silly i made it in my apartment when i was yeah very young um, I remember like you're saying like weasels, weasels or something. I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. Yeah. We, we can I, just to be fair. When you watch that film, every cell in my body has been replaced. I'm a completely right. different person. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I, I wanted to talk to you, but I didn't want to bring you on and talk about like the American astronaut for two hours. Cause that was, you know, a long time ago, you have a big body of work. To, yeah, to actually, just... every cell, every cell is different from that mm. too. Yeah, uh, I. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I mean, you know, in space, they in the space station they vacuum every day everything, and one of the reasons is because your body is swapping out cells. So you take off your socks, and like dead cells go flying everywhere. Uh, in space so they're always vacuuming up dead skin cells because your body's replacing them by the what? millions on a daily basis they just shoot them out into space what's that do they just shoot out the the trash out in the space like the skin cells you think i think they eat them you think they eat them oh well, they drink pee pee oh, yeah. <laughs> no i don't know i don't know they, i don't know <laughs> um you know I, another a story which i love and it's only touched on in trauma zone is um, the cosmonaut who was up in the space station when the Soviet union collapsed. Yeah. Um, awesome guy. Just like I, I, they have interviews with him in trauma zone when he found out that basically the company that put him up there doesn't exist anymore. So nobody can come and get him. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, nobody fine. Can, yeah. And he's like, well, I guess I'm going to be here longer than I thought. <laughs> and, uh, and he's really, he's so cool about it. Nice looking guy too. Real handsome, you know, cosmonaut guy. And, uh, he, uh, he was up there for like, he was supposed to be up there for like a hundred days, something like that. He was up there for like a year and a half till they could go get him out. That, that's a big difference. <laughs> it that. is. It is. Yeah. But he was cool about it, you know? I, I mean, it's either, I guess, be cool about or panic. I, I'm sure I would panic at least at first. Yeah. Yeah, I know I know people who, if, if the, that were their situation, you know, they'd be up there in space by themselves going, this is bullshit. <laughs> well, I've always, I'm the type of person, like, you could tell me, hey, you're not allowed to leave your house. And I'd freak out. Or I could choose to stay in my house, and I'd be fine. Like, if, if it's conditionally on me versus, like, being forced upon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So if it was like, oh, I'm going to go and stay a year and a half in space because I want to. Okay. First, you have to. It's a very different yeah. mindset. It's like, hey, that toilet doesn't flush. Don't put your hand in it. You can't tell right. me not to put my hand into that toilet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> who, who do you think you're talking to? Yeah. The rebellious nature. Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. Now, now, you, now you've done it. Yeah. <laughs> You've been living in New York for a long time now, right? Yes, I have. I, I've been. Um, I've had three children here. Got married here. Um, the uh, I've been here for twenty four years. First, like growing up and and living a lot of time on the uh, opposite coast. Um, yeah. Now, how do people differ? Do you think like, have you seen a, a big difference in people? This is something I ask for people who have lived on both coasts. Well, I, I, I always say that the West coast was the birthplace of passive aggression. Okay. Um, here people are much more, um, they seemingly rude, yes. but, but very honest and nice as to where a lot of the people I grew up around seemed really nice but 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 you know right um, i mean there's still i mean I, not to say that about everybody i mean there's a lot of unbelievably wonderful fantastic people in um you know that I, that i grew up with and love but the style of rudeness is different okay i i you know i'm on i'm in new jersey so i'm just curious about things like that i've only been out to california and the west coast once in my life for about two weeks to experience it and i, I even got a sense of like the laid backness but also like on guardness versus like here we're up front about being like assholes but also willing to lend a hand well i think one of the things too that changes things here in new york versus uh california is public transportation um yeah everybody takes it and so everybody is exposed to each other uh as opposed to in california where everybody is in their own little capsule and um you know they could they could assume they feel ways about people that never has to be challenged <laughs> you know what i mean right yeah yeah i never thought about that aspect but it makes a lot of sense yeah they're 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 um yeah they're 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 never put to the test, I guess you'd say, um, as to where here you, you, you know, you, you, you're always dealing with people constantly. Right. Yeah. Which I like, you know, I, I like sometimes, sometimes I do. <laughs> yeah. Where in Jersey are you? I'm in South Jersey. So I'm like closer to the Philadelphia area. Are you, are you, my, Cape May? Uh, I'm like uh, in Gloucester County. I don't know if you know where that is. I'll know, you know Rowan University if I'm around there. The Pine I, Barrens. The Pine Barrens. Oh, my God. I rode my bike. I one of My, my first overnighter thing, it was a five-night ride. I, I took a ferry to the top of Jersey and rode all the way down to Cape May and back. Cape May is gorgeous. It, it was amazing. But the Pine Barrens, there was one stretch where it was just sand yeah and it said and it was a road and it's like follow this road on my gps i'm like sure i will and so i'm I, my bike weighs more than me it's got all these big bags and things hanging off it and i'm dragging it through sand like the wheels don't turn i'm pushing and pushing it was like 90 degrees and i'm in the middle of nothing you know <laughs> and so i'm thinking all right well i got my bear spray with me if a bear comes out, because there's a lot of bears in New Jersey, more black bears in New yeah. Jersey than anywhere else in, in the States. Mm. So if a bear comes at me, I've got my bear spray. But if some weird hillbilly comes at me, I can spray him. The pineys. But, but the spray's going to wear off, and I'm only going to be about like 10 feet ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't move in it. I've gone hiking in there. One time I had to get... I had a call 
for someone to come pick me up because I messed up my leg and uh, I slept through it and I had to get I couldn't walk in the sand anymore like all my gear on. Uh, it was it's, it's grueling. It's, it's grueling. And well, it said you know three quarters of a mile, and then there was supposed yeah. to be another, another street ahead, and the next one. And so like I thought I could do this three quarters of a mile. So I drug the bike, pushed the bike. I got up to the the turning point, and it was the same road for another five miles. Yeah. <laughs> and you yeah. slept out there? No, I made it. I mean, but uh. I, oh, I you pushed left, through the pine barrens. Okay, I pushed through. I pushed through the sand and the pine barrens. It was it was one of the worst things ever. There's coyotes <laughs> out there, as I was going to say. If you didn't experience them, you got lucky. <laughs> if you're ever through there again, just be careful. Yeah. Oh, the, actually, um, you, you know Stillman Town. I do not. Stillman Town. They're in New Jersey. If you ever find yourself there, there's a wonderful. Um, green burial ground called the Stillman town cemetery. That uh, is one of the cemeteries I worked with and the place is beautiful. And there's this organic moss that happens there that covers all of their uh, paths. It's, it looks like Iceland. It's just, it's lovely, lovely place. Stillman town cemetery. I, nice place to, to check out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I regrettably, I've only been to like New York maybe six times in my life because I'm such a Philly centered person. Because it's like the tri state area is, is so small and so big at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Do you know Philomoka? The yes, theater? I do. I've performed there many times. Uh, I, when, I, I, when I was doing I've my bicycle there. ride, I, I uh, performed there. And then um, we all slept on the stage and on the floor and then left the next morning to continue the ride oh cool yeah, yeah, yeah. I, i've parked out there before a few times <laughs> and i've yeah, been in there they're great 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 little theater or good size theater but it's great yeah. great place good sound too great place to perform a lot of the uh there's a lot of footage in uh, deep astronomy deep astronomy and the romantic sciences that was shot there i i saw and i was like that looks like philly like that looks yeah like I picked up on it. Um, well, it looks like we're about at a two-hour point. We are. Yeah, we've kept I'm you not... on the hook here. Is there, is there anything? Yeah, I, hope, uh... I, I, I hope I didn't drag. I, 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 no, I, uh, I had a great time. Uh, me too. Thank you so much for having me. This has been really nice. Is there anything that you specific that you would like me to put a link to in the video description or just the RRPC, RPPC? Um, or? Yeah, if you could uh, put a link to uh, redplanetplanningcommission.com. Um, okay. That way people can see a few of the things we've been talking about if they want. Yeah, uh, I'll do that. And, yeah. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Thank you very much. This has much. been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And, and send me some links, too, and I'll, I'll, I'll share them as well. Yeah, I can, we can DM you them for right. uh, when the VODs and things are up. Okay, and if if there's ever any reason you want me back, the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, well, great. We, we'll we'll probably take you up on that at some point. All right, excellent. I'll talk great. to you soon. Thank you so excellent. much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. That was Corey McAbee. Uh, you can check out his movie right now at redplanetplanningcommission.com. And it is called Deep Astronomy and the Romantic Sciences. If you go to that page on his website, you can watch the movie for free. And that was a great conversation with him. Hey, do, do you want to like move over to uh, <laughs> our own phone call? So I don't know. Oh, we can. I don't know if that's yeah. going to be weird for him if we're hanging out in this group DM. <laughs> yeah, we can. We can do that. All right. <clears throat> Brief. Uh, brief intermission and we're back and we're back wow incredible yeah thanks what to Corey that? McAbee for coming on uh, cool guy should we 
We're about two hours in. Did you want to keep going with this episode, or do you uh, I feel like it would be a little folly to like go into yeah. <laughs> TC cab and yeah. I don't mind uh, great silence uh, talking to you here live when to end the episode. We can yeah. I think we can wrap the episode, but uh, so thank you for listening. That was Corey Maccabee. I can't uh, wait personally to watch more stuff and try to hunt down the Brian Nair project. Is that, did I even say it right? Billy Nair. Billy, <laughs> sorry. The Billy Nair project, uh, music. Yeah. Um, very interesting guy. Great films. Yeah. Hopefully come back again. I'll talk to you some more. But uh yeah, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna play Bye, the, the outro music and uh God bless, stay safe. <laughs> See you soon.